Previously on. Tea time. Wes. Okay, so when you are doing oral arguments in front of the Supreme Court, it is very much like a conversation, right? So basically the judges are inquiring, they're asking questions, trying to understand to help them um, come to a conclusion or how they should uh, decide on the case or each justice, I should say, where they fall um, within the case. So we will hear um, the questions that the justices um, ask of the Moore's counsel. Uh, do you have a definition for that or an explanation as to exactly what it is? And, and how is it different from, say, attribution? Um, thank you, Justice Thomas. Uh, realization in the main is going to be receipt, but in other instances it would be other types of enjoyment uh, of an economic gain such that the taxpayer can put that gain uh, to his or her own uses and benefits. That might be forgiveness of a loan uh, or it might be uh, assignment of income to a third party. Well, there certainly is realization here uh, uh, by the corporation, if not the taxpayers, right? It isn't a case like appreciation of property where nothing has happened. Um, uh, you know, you buy property, you're holding it for 20 years, you haven't sold it, nothing has happened. Here something has happened and uh, income has gone to the corporation. Isn't that right? Yes, the corporation has income. And we, we don't dispute that the corporation realized income over the decade plus years that are being taxed by the MRT. Um, but I, I think it really is like the instance of simply appreciation of property from the point of view of the shareholders. The shareholders' interest in the corporation is solely a capital interest, a property interest. And so the value of their capital has increased, it has appreciated, uh, but as shareholders, no, they have not realized any income. So tell me. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> how I'm understanding it, and I'm just thinking this through, is that the Moore's argument is that they just have an ownership interest in into this company. And the, the ownership interest in the company increased, but they didn't actually receive any of the increase themselves. Like it was not, there was not a check cut to them. They did not receive extra income due to this increase. So the increase was reinvested. We pay property taxes because we own the property. And if the value of the property increases, then of course, like we would pay more property taxes. If the value of the property decreases, then that means the property tax would be less. However, the Moors are saying that they actually own property interest in the company and that it is not income because even though the company the company's revenue or the company had some sort of increase that increase was not passed on to them therefore they should not have to pay any income because they never received any income very much similar to if you owned a piece of land and let's just say because of where your land was situated or located, the surrounding properties increase. Therefore, your land increase because their interest is their property interest in a sense is in a company and the company did well to increase. It doesn't necessarily mean that they received income and that they should pay income on that. So theirs is as of more as of. This is property. Yes, like there is an increase, but it did not impact us. It's not income. This is truly property. So whatever tax there is, it needs to be apportioned. So they are going at it from a purely like property um, interest viewpoint. So we will see. Part two. when there are so many good questions and 
there are his good responses. Um, so pretty much, so sub part F, um, sub chapter S, these are all ways in which um, owners of a corporation um, can be taxed on their income or not taxed on income that's coming from a corporation or a particular sort of business structure. Um, one of the things that Justice Sotomayor brought up, which does make sense, is that in a partnership, um, there is taxation without realization in certain instances. And she is um, definitely trying to differentiate or almost in a sense, and, and we're going to talk, she's going to bring up first principles. So I guess they're going to start from the beginning. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll get into that. But the fact that there has been realization without um, there has been taxation without realization in other parts of the Internal Revenue Code. And so her thing is like, why is there this difference with this? And so that was his response regarding subpart F. Um, and then she also mentioned subchapter S. Like these are situations in which sh like shareholders or, or owners of a corporation would be taxed on income that they have not necessarily realized or received. And so that was the line of questioning with that. Um, and so we will listen at what she has to say next. It's just really hard to like find a good stopping area without also like just being respectful too. But anyway, here we go. Um, the concept of realization was very well established at the time that the 16th Amendment was adopted. But the amendment does not reference realization. All that the drafters had to do was add the word realized after income to lay and collect taxes on income realized, but they never used the word realized. And then I look at the history both before and after the ratification, as far back as 1864, not so far back, Congress taxed from the ratification, Congress taxed, quote, gains and profits of all companies, whether incorporated or partnerships, in, est in estimating the annual gains, profits, or income of any person entitled to the same, whether divided or undivided. In 1913, just eight months after the ratification of the 16th Amendment, Congress included undistributed corporate earnings to certain shareholders. Your brief tries to distinguish all these things, but I come back to the main point. Both sides can point to congressional actions that tax some realized income, some or didn't, unrealized, didn't tax unrealized income, but we have examples of Congress taxing realized, real, unrealized income. Why don't I take it that the plain text of the amendment doesn't make reference to realization? I think there are two central features of the text of the amendment. Okay. So her question, I got really excited because it talked a lot about what uh, my portion of the article was, was to try to figure out. Um, I was from a state's perspective, though, um, whether states did uh, t like had taxes on unrealized income, like state income taxes. Um, and a couple of the states actually did. And so basically her point is that back in 1864, Congress actually did like have a tax on unrealized income. So according to that theory, by the time the 16th Amendment came around 1913, of course, like realization was already defined. Um, it already had its place. People knew what it was. People knew whether they received income or not. And at that point, individuals had been taxed on income that they didn't receive. So her theory is why does that word realize need to be there in the 16th Amendment in order for this to even apply to this particular case. And so now we're going to hear his response. I think that's a really good argument and that's a really fair question because if it was a settled matter prior to 1913, then why would we be bringing this up in 2023? So let's listen to his response. Mint that reflect that uh, it does apply only to realized gains. Um, the first is simply the use of the word income. Uh, I would particularly commend to the court's attention the amicus brief filed by the uh, professors of law and linguistics, which analyzes the use of the word income uh, in period texts. As I go back, all of this goes back and forth because the government has other definitions. Um, we're, we're, we're back in square one if what we're doing is weighing historical 
definitions? The weighing in this case, Your Honor, is quite lopsided. Okay, I was, I'm not trying to cut off a of justice because I feel like what they say is very important, really important. And so, um, pretty much, she just does not want to hear, like, these amicus briefs because the reality is, um, I think with this case, when we like the the last time we I think I we took a real good look at the briefs were like back in September and there were already almost four dozen there are over thirty I want to say over forty briefs at that particular time like some in favor of the government some in favor of the Moors and the thing is like in this instance like she's right like no matter what you do there can always be you can find um, cases, you can find historical evidence for your side. The government has found evidence for its side. We're saying that there does not have to be realization. And also the Moors found evidence for its side saying that there does have to be realization. So we need to come to some sort of like breaking ground because if we just rely on these amicus briefs, then there's always a brief that can counter it. And so you never really get anywhere, which is what Justice Sotomayor is saying that we have to come to some other something else that can tell us what we need to do because otherwise we're just in this like tug of war <laughs> where both sides literally have the exact same thing so i think this is why being a supreme court justice is really hard because by the time you are at this level you literally have everything in your arsenal out there and you will find that a lot of your adversaries or your opponents will have the same sort of weaponry that you have and then you know what do you do at that particular sense like how do you figure out you know who's right or who's wrong if you're looking at the battlefield and there's the exact same like layout on both sides but I think um what she's trying to get to is great and so we'll just go right back into it um, the government relies principally on two definitions that were that were put forward by economists in the years following the amendment's adoption, and neither of which reflects the common understanding at the time. One of the economists recognized that he was simply espousing his own economic views, divorced from any question of law or common understanding. And the second economist recognized that the common understanding of income is what we say that it was, a realized gain. Um, so far as the common understanding of the term was concerned, the, o the only indication that the court has before it, aside from dictionaries which, again, lopsidedly favor our position, uh, is, is the corpus linguistics analysis of the professors of law and linguistics, uh, which looks at how the word was used in everyday language at that time. And it concludes that unanimously, where it's possible to distinguish, income meant realized gains. There's also in the amendment, uh, the language from whatever source derived. As we pointed out, derived was generally meant to refer to concepts like receipt. And indeed, again, the amicus brief of the professors of law and linguistics recognized that when income was described as being derived, it was always used in that fashion. I guess I'm not... So here's the end to the second video. This goes over the second question. And I actually wanted to keep this part in here pretty whole because I just love Justice Sotomayor's reasoning. She sets the foundation of it. Like with her questions, she just like builds the foundation, builds the house, builds the base of where we are with the entire case. And I just love how she just like asks those questions and it makes you think and it makes you go back in history to kind of see. But she's also like, we need another definition. We need something other than the fact that the battlefield is the same, that both sides have briefs actually showing that their side is right. You have to find a different way um, to do that. And so I think she did a great job with the questioning. It definitely helped me understand a lot. The things that I wasn't able to understand through reading the briefs, and I hope it helped you also as well. So that's it for the Morris Council. If you want to know more, definitely check out the oral arguments yourself. I think his are about 45 minutes. The government's also about 45 minutes. And then there is room for rebuttal. But always, if you ever want to have a chat over tea, you certainly know where to find me. Thank you for liking, subscribing, commenting, doing all these fun things that are great. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Tea time. Wes. Come.